for uh, now first presentation of the afternoon we have this uh, the impact of higher data rate requirements on MIPI CSI and MIPI DSI designs. We have two presenters with us, uh, Brian Dallenbach of Northwest Logic and Ashraf Takla of Mixel. Uh, Brian is the president of the Northwest Logic. He has an electrical engineering degree uh, from Oregon State University and a master's degree from Stanford. He has worked in the system and chip design businesses for more than 20 years. Uh, Brian worked for VLSA technology and applied signal technology prior to Northwest Logic. Ashraf is the president and CEO of Mixel, which he founded in 1998. Before founding Mixel, he was director of mixed signal design at Hitachi Microsystems and also worked at AMI and Sierra Semiconductors. Mr. Takala has 35 years of experience in analog and mixed signal designs. He holds five patents. Mixel has been an active MIPI member since 2006. Um, welcome, Brian. Welcome, Ashraf. Please take us away. Excellent. Please. Thank you so much. All right, well, it's great to see everybody. Uh, we'll try to keep this informative. Uh, if you uh, start falling asleep after lunch, I'm going to come out and personally uh, wake you up. So uh, we have to have some people paying attention here. But it's a pleasure for Ashraf and I to come and uh, present to you. Uh, it's a topic that's uh, very relevant, which is uh, what's going on in the camera and display uh, markets. Uh, and we're going to kind of talk about that, some of the trends and then how those trends uh, have been addressed by the standards, and then how those trends are gonna affect you as you go off and uh, do MIPI designs. So uh, Ashford and I are gonna uh, do some handoffs uh, periodically, so hopefully we can do that smoothly and uh, we'll, get, uh, we'll get through this. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, please uh, uh, keep them to the end and uh, we'll be happy to uh, address the questions to the best of our ability. All right, with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Oops. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, fundamentally the problem is not that complex. The, the problem uh, is, and I've got some uh, graphs that'll show this uh, with some specific numbers, uh, the problem fundamentally is uh, cameras and displays are getting uh, to be higher resolution. Uh, we're all familiar with, you know, uh, the transition in our, in our living room uh, of our TVs from standard definition to high definition. Okay, that's happening in uh, the camera and display marketplace. Uh, but not only are cameras and displays uh, getting uh, more resolution, but the resolution that's being shown uh, is increasing both in terms of the pixel depth and in terms of the frame rate. So all those three trends uh, combined are causing uh, the amount of data that you need to transfer uh, into, uh, uh, into a display or out of a camera. Those numbers are, are rapidly increasing. So as we uh, talk to our customers uh, and they're trying to future-proof their products, uh, very commonly we get asked, so you know, what does that mean for us? What do we have to do to make sure that our product is still going to be cutting edge uh, two, three years uh, uh, in the market from now? So that's what we're specifically going to uh, talk about. Of course, as those data rates are going up, uh, the uh, MIPI Alliance, uh, which is been defining a whole suite of uh, industry standards. Uh, specifically, there's a standard to talk to cameras, that's the camera serial interface, and there's a standard to talk to displays, and that's the display serial interface, and there's associated PHI standards. Uh, those standards are all evolving to support these higher data rates. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through those, uh, we're going to go through these trends and talk about uh, those standards and then some of the things that, that impacts your design. So just to let you know a little bit more about uh, who Ashraf and I are, um, I am the president of a, a company that provides controllers. Uh, we specifically provide MIPI controllers, CSI and DSI, and also PCI Express and uh, DRAM, HBM. And uh, Ashraf's company uh, provides uh, a range of FIs, uh, specifically DFI, CFI, MFI, and Combo uh, DNC FI. So what we do together is we basically take the best of uh -oh. 
<laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen again. That'll keep you awake though. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what we do together then is we take our uh, uh, state-of-the-art controllers, uh, Astra's uh, state-of-the-art FIs, and put them, uh, put them together and deliver them as a complete solution uh, to, our, to our customers. Okay, so here's, uh, here's uh, one look at uh, camera data rates and uh, display data rates. And one thing that's important to note is as, uh, as you've been, uh, as the MIPI uh, Alliance has been uh, going, and you've seen, been seeing this, these presentations, what you see is that in the very, very beginning of MIPI, it was really focused on phones, okay? And phones have certain display requirements and phones uh, have, uh, have certain uh, camera requirements. Uh, what is happening now is because the phone market is such high volume, that phone market has driven the creation of extremely low-cost displays and extremely low-cost uh, cameras. And so those low-cost cameras and displays are popping up in all sorts of other marketplaces. The application processors that process the signals that are going to these cameras and displays, uh, you know, uh, things like the, Inte the Tegra processors, Snapdragon, those are showing up in other markets too. And so what's happening is this, uh, there's a, a, a tidal wave that's flowing out from uh, the mobile phone market into all these other markets that is driving the adoption of MIPI-based cameras and displays and application processors in those markets. And the automotive industry, which Ashraf gave a presentation yesterday on, is a perfect example of that. Uh, you have lots of cameras and displays in an, in an automobile, uh, especially in the smart automobiles. And guess what? All those cameras and displays use MIPI. So the cameras and displays that you have in an automobile, though, are going to have slightly different characteristics than the ones you might have in a, in a smartphone. So, this is just to give you some general idea of, of, of the trends, but the trends within any particular market segment will you know, be in different spots uh, along these curves. So let's just see what this looks like then. So if you take a look at the cameras, uh, it, you know, the easy way that cameras are judged is sort of resolution. You, know, you buy a Motorola Droid and it's got a you know, 12 megapixel camera. Okay, so 12 megapixel camera, and then you know, what's the frame rate of that camera and what's the uh, uh, the resolution uh, uh, per, uh, per bit. And you can see, obviously, if you have a 30 hertz 8-bit resolution, then that puts you on a certain curve as, as you increase the resolution of the camera. Uh, but if you have 60 hertz, uh, 20 bits, uh, then uh, you have a lot more bandwidth uh, requirements. So, and you see uh, in the various marketplaces, you see uh, lots of cameras uh, that are uh, in in between uh, these two ends, and, and some people are even talking about uh, higher precision and higher frame rates. So uh, outside of the camera space, what you see is uh, as resolution is going on, there's a drive towards uh, upwards of 30 uh, gigabits per second that you might get out of a particular camera. On the display side of things, uh, very similar trend. You have different uh, resolutions. These are common resolutions in the, uh, uh, in the smartphone uh, uh, business nowadays. Uh, transitioning to higher resolutions, uh, these kind of resolutions you can find uh, potentially in automobiles, uh, uh, evolving out to, uh, up to uh, UHD, uh, and, and those kind of resolutions uh, d based on the frame rate, and I'm not sure where that uh, came from, but uh, basically the frame rate of uh, going to 24 bits, 30 bits, or 36 bits, uh, once again you can have uh, a need for upwards of 30 gigabits uh, per second of total throughput uh, going out to a display. So increasing amounts of throughput, both in the camera and display business, what's the MIPI Alliance doing to address those needs? So uh, we've heard a lot of presentations. The keynote speaker did a nice job of talking about uh, where where the MIPI Alliance is coming from. But fundamentally, uh, way back in 2003, the MIPI Alliance was formulated to solve one key problem. And that key problem was, within a smartphone, there was all these different interfaces and all these different ways of talking to things. Specifically, in the camera and display marketplaces, every camera from uh, different manufacturers used their own proprietary interface. So if you were going to design a chip that was going to talk to all these cameras, you had a huge problem because everybody, every camera out there had something different. So 
There was no standard, so that was a tremendous uh, drawback. Same on the display side of things. So the MIPI Alliance basically saw that as a problem, was formed to address that issue, and has created uh, industry standards to make it possible uh, to, for everybody uh, to talk to the same uh, mobile devices and, the, and the, uh, the hardware that connects to those mobile devices. So specifically, uh, the camera serial interface uh, was formulated to talk to cameras. And at, at, at its base, it's a relatively straightforward packet-based protocol. Okay, you basically, take, you basically take a bunch of pixels, you stick them in a packet, you add some stuff with the packet, CRC and a, uh, some error protection, and you transmit the packet to the other side, and at the other end, you pull the data back out, uh, and uh, that's uh, at its fundamental basis. That's what uh, a camera serial interface uh, protocol looks like. And this protocol now has become widely used. The cameras that are in your smartphones and lots of other places are almost all um, uh, based on CSI uh, nowadays. Same thing in the display space. Uh, the display serial interface is a, is a packet-based protocol uh, for basically taking a, a group of pixels, uh, transmitting to the other end. It's got, uh, once again, its own uh, packet overhead to manage those packets, provide some timing information. Uh, and this, uh, this standard is also extremely widely used. So, uh, so that's, that's what the MIPI standards has done, and that's really driven down uh, the price of cameras and displays, uh, which are being used in that phone market. And as we've talked about, that has then spread uh, throughout uh, the rest of the industries, and this trend will co uh, continue. So the next topic at hand is to talk a little bit more about the physical interface piece. The camera and uh, display interfaces, uh, those are the top-level protocols, but they depend on an electrical interface, which is defined separately and then referenced by the standard. And Ashraf, as the FI provider, is going to tell you about that side of things. Thanks, Brian. So um, there are currently three uh, different kinds of uh, physical layers used in MIPI. Um, the first one uh, that has been introduced um, at the beginning uh, more than 10 years ago is uh, DeFi. Uh, the DeFi is a source, source synchronous file, very different than um, your typical surges that has um, uh, uh, clock embedded uh, information. Uh, it usually uh, comes in one clock, so we need to send one clock and then multiple data. The most common configuration now is probably four data lanes. Um, and it has two modes of operation. One is low power and high speed, and that's kind of what um, distinguishes it from other files. So we are using uh, real to real signaling for the low power, and we are using uh, LDDS type of signaling for the uh, high speed. And um, um, this is the most uh, common file used in, in, in the industry today in both camera and display. Um, uh, this is the widest, de uh, widest deployed kind of file. Um, historically, the end file came after that. And um, so uh, that is, uh, was targeted for higher uh, data rates. It's uh, more of a standard file is that it's, uh, uh, the clock is embedded. You have full CDR, and um, uh, you have a minimum configuration of one transmit lane, one receive lane. Uh, <coughs> um, and and uh, it was also targeted for um, uh, um, displays, for cameras. Uh, although that um, adoption has not happened as rapidly as uh, most people expected. Um, a few years ago, the C file was introduced, and that's another um, different file. It basically comes in trios. So, and of course, um, George gave a very good presentation in the morning about specifically about the C file. Those of you that attended that configuration would appreciate the complexity of, of, of the C file. Um, so it um, has some amplitude information built into the code. Um, it's, um, the clock is embedded. Um, so for each unit interval, you're getting a, uh, an edge, and you use that to uh, recover the data. 
So um, to convert um, the number bits per second um, related to symbol per second, you have a multiplier of 2.28. So it's uh, the code enable you to communicate uh, more data at lower uh, transition uh, rate. Um, the C file um, uses the same low power operation as the D file. It is intended to be, um, use the same pins uh, at the D file and provide an easy transition uh, between the D file and C file. Um, right now, most of the use is in camera, and um, we see uh, increased adoption there. Um, getting back to the MFI, currently the main, most uh, important applications or use cases for the MFI is um, uh, UFS, which is a memory interface, and also a digital F, which is a chip-to-chip um, -chip communication standard. Um, this slide shows the different uh, versions uh, and the associated data rate with each of those versions for the three um, uh, files. Actually, this one shows for the C file and the D file, and uh, also the, 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 the uh, interface on the parallel side. So um, first one, as I mentioned, was um, uh, D file. In 2009, um, it operated, uh, operated up to one gig. Um, the, uh, serial, the parallel interface is eight bits. Uh, in 2011, the DFI 1.1 um, extended the range to 1.5 gigabit per second, and the uh, parallel interface stayed at 8. At 1.2, um, um, uh, which uh, was introduced in 2014, the data rate uh, was extended to 2.5 gig, um, and, and again, the, the interface stayed at 8. And this is kind of where most of the new silicon is targeted for. Um, recently, this year, 2.0 have been um, approved, um, and that runs at uh, 4.5 gigabit per second. Uh, but then the parallel interface is extended uh, to enable the uh, controller and the um, um, uh, uh, other digital parts of the system to operate at a manageable uh, clock rate. And I'm sure Brian will cover more about that. Um, next one that is slated for introduction later this year, uh, early um, um, first quarter of 2017. Um, most likely, uh, actually, um, it, it will be a 4.5 gig. There have been discussion about uh, doing something higher, but it seems like the consensus right now is going to be 4.5 gig with the same kind of um, uh, a parallel interface. Well, with regard to the C file, um, first version was introduced in 2014. As I mentioned, it's a trio. Each trio supports up to 2.5 giga uh, symbol per second, which translates into 2.5 times 2.28 um, uh, gigabit per second, and that uses a 16-bit interface. 1.1 stayed at the same data rate and the same interface, uh, but there were some enhancements, and that was approved in uh, February of this year. Next uh, version will go to, uh, to, uh, go to 3.5 gig, uh, giga symbol per second, again targeted for um, end of this year or the uh, first quarter of, two, uh, of 2017. Next, we'll look at um, how the data rate increased um, uh, across time um, and uh, uh, for the different files. Um, so the D file started uh, here. This is um, assuming the four lane. So this is like four gigabit per second, one gigabit per second per lane. Um, somewhere around here, we went to 1.5. And then uh, in 2014, uh, 2.5, and then um, 2016, yeah, we have the 4.5. So of course, this is multiplied by 4, and this is the aggregate uh, data rate. Uh, for the C file, started later, but had a, 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 a speed advantage because of the multiplier. 
um, and and um, by the end of uh, of, of, of um, this year, beginning of next year, it's going to be limited to 3.5 gig. So this shows a three a trio. This is four trio. Most of the application we, we see now is the three trio, and the good reason for that is uh, it is intended to be. Uh, we use the same pins for the D5. So for the D5, that is um, four lanes, you need 10 pins because you need a clock. So you have um, five times uh, two is 10. Then you use nine out of the pins for three tools. Um, so actually, you can have a combo that uses the same pins, and that's one of the products that we have. So that is uh, where I will turn it back to Brian. Excellent. Yeah, one thing that is uh, interesting uh, about this, if you go back to those uh, camera and display chart that I hit at the very beginning, you saw numbers that are uh, uh, ramping towards uh, 30 gigabit per second. And what's interesting here is uh, to try to sort of normalize things, once again, uh, here is total throughput. Uh, there's the 30 uh, gigabit per second number. And what you can see is that the MIPI Alliance uh, has aligned its roadmap to ensure that as those higher resolutions uh, start to be hit, uh, that uh, the MIPI standards are already in place uh, to, uh, to address uh, the market needs uh, for uh, 30 gigabit per second. So what's, uh, what's uh, very exciting about that is, uh, like Asher pointed out today, um, most cameras are now starting to, uh, uh, and displays are starting to adopt the 2.5 gigabit per second. Uh, so, but the standards are already there. Uh, it's feature-proofed. Uh, so, uh, designs that can start today, if you started MIPI design today, uh, you know the standard's going to be there to evolve, uh, support your needs as your product needs uh, uh, evolve. So, that's uh, extremely important. So, now, that's the phi piece of it, but once again, there's a camera uh, and display uh, standards uh, that incorporate uh, the phi standards. Uh, so, in the same way that the, uh, the, um, the PHI uh, uh, standards have been evolving, uh, the camera standards have evolved to incorporate that. Uh, specifically, uh, CSI2 1.0 was uh, uh, way back in 20, uh, 2005, and it incorporated uh, the D5.58 version. And as the D5s have evolved, uh, so have the uh, CSI versions. And these CSI versions, not only do they include uh, new five versions, but there's also other enhancements made to the protocol. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the most recent enhancements is the support of raw 16 and raw 20-bit uh, data types. So uh, there's all sorts of things that evolve as the standards evolve. Uh, ultimately, then, uh, what you're going to see is there'll be a CSI uh, 2.0 standard, and it actually looks at this point in time like what's going to happen is because the uh, D5 2.1 and C5 1.2 standards will actually, looks like they'll be uh, finalized either late uh, Q4 or early Q1, uh, when the 2.0 standard uh, is then released, it'll actually uh, incorporate these, uh, these latest versions of standards. So the 2.1 standard will actually be something uh, a little bit different than that. Um, but the point is the standards evolve and they're supporting uh, the absolute latest FIs and, um, and that's all available. Same thing on the DSI side, uh, with one uh, interesting exception. So the way CSI 2 has worked is uh, they've just been increasing. And when they went, uh, went from 1.3 to 2.0, uh, they, they basically jumped major revs. Uh, what they decided to do on the DSI side, the initial DSI standards were uh, started with 1.0 and evolved all the way to 1.3. And then instead of basically uh, going from DSI uh, 1.3 to 2.0, uh, they decided to actually call that standard DSI 2. So uh, DSI and DSI 2 uh, basically are, are very similar uh, standard. Uh, DSI 2 is just a, an evolution of DSI. Uh, and, uh, and it uh, incorporates uh, the DSI 2 incorporates the CFI. So that's how they decided to do that. And uh, just as you'd expect, uh, there will be a 1.1 version of DSI-2 that will incorporate the latest DeFi and CFI standards. The exact date for that hasn't been set, but uh, you know, we would expect that to happen uh, sometime probably in 2017. 
So that's where uh, the standards are. And uh, it's interesting, as we talk to customers, uh, this chart has been uh, very useful to people because everybody's like, well, what's 1.2 and what's 1.1 and which version of the phi is included in which? So here's your handy dandy little decoder ring for that. Okay, so that's what's going on with the market needs. That's what's going on with the standards. And now let's talk, uh, switch topics and, uh, and talk about uh, some of the impacts that this is going to have uh, on you. So uh, the first impact is, is obvious, and that is as the uh, data rates are going up, uh, the, uh, the rates that you have to clock uh, the logic are going up uh, uh, at the same rates. So uh, what Ashworth pointed out on his phi, uh, on his uh, phi chart, historically, uh, there's an industry standard called PPI, which is the standard that defines how a PHI talks to a controller. And uh, with DFI up until, uh, up until the present time, the interface has been 8 bits per lane. So if you have four lanes and you have 8 bits per lane, that means you're going to have 32 bits of data going between the PHI and the controller. And guess what? When the controller processes the data and it pulls out the pixels, it's going to basically hand that data off uh, to, uh, to the user at something in the order of 32 bits, uh, 32 bits wide. So what's happening now, though, is uh, that worked uh, real well. So the controller basically operates at 1 8 the rate uh, of the phi. But with uh, CFI, the rates for CFI are high enough that uh, it, uh, the CFI standard does not support 8 bits uh, per lane. Uh, it starts at 16 bits per lane. So all of a sudden, if you're going to have three lanes of CFI, three lanes times 16 bits per lane means you got 48 bits. So immediately, you have to have a wider controller and you have to have wider user logic uh, to process uh, the data. So what we expect to see happening is CFI has already made the transition to 16 bits per lane. Uh, the DFI standard now supports 8, 16, and 32 bits per lane. Uh, we expect to see uh, a, a majority of designs over time migrating to 16 bits per lane. And as you can see, the standards continue to evolve higher data rates. Uh, the standard now supports 32 bits per lane. So there's no question at some point in time in the future, uh, you're likely to see uh, 32 bits per lane, but that's still a ways off. Um, that's not going to happen in the, next, uh, in the next two or three years. Most of the things are going to be 16 bits per lane uh, with uh, some uh, uh, you know, low to medium applications uh, that are DeFi only running at 8 bits per lane. So just like I talked about, uh, with a controller, you take four lanes and you go to 32 bits. If you have four lanes and it's 16 bits per lane, now you need 64 bits. And in the future, uh, we do expect to see, uh, as 32 bits per lane happens, we expect to see a transition uh, out in the future uh, uh, to 128 bits per, uh, uh, 128 bit width. The other thing that's happening, the marketplace to this point in time has been dominated by, uh, when I say the marketplace, I'm talking about the camera and display marketplaces. They've been dominated by DeFi. DeFi is what's been used. That's what's out there. Uh, that's, uh, that's, CFI is just now starting to show up uh, in cameras. In fact, uh, the Qualcomm folks out there uh, have a, uh, a demonstration of a Sony uh, CFI based camera. So uh, uh, CFI is just now starting to show up uh, in the camera space. Uh, it's not showing up yet in the display space, but uh, we expect that to happen. Uh, as, uh, as um, people start adopting the DSI-2 uh, standard. Uh, so you've, you're going to have the situation where uh, if the marketplace is uh, going to adopt CFI, it's going to be adopted initially by doing uh, combo uh, D and CFI operation. Uh, just like Ashraf pointed out, uh, the nice thing about CFI is it's pin out, uh, the, pin out, the pin count is uh, compatible with DeFi, so what people are basically doing now is they're, uh, they're implementing um, multi-mode DeFi and CFI FIs. And the reason for that is if you're uh, a camera vendor and, and you want to go release a CFI only camera, you've got to talk to all the other stuff that's out there in the world. Well, the application processors and all the things that you might want to talk to, they don't all have CFI yet. So you can't, as a camera provider, provide something that's CFI only you've got to have a multi-mode operation. So that's how the market makes a transition. 
There'll be a lot of multi-mode stuff for at least the next three, four years. And then uh, if CFI is fully adopted, uh, like many people expect, uh, then at that point in time, the market will be uh, mature enough in terms of having CFI support so that people can start doing CFI only types of applications. But that's still a ways out. So let's take a look at specific clock rates. And this will give you a little better understanding of things. So this line right here, this is the 8-bit uh, PPI uh, DeFi line. So just to get your, get your arms around this, if you have a one gigabit per second uh, data lane uh, and uh, you process that then, and, you, and you convert it to eight bits, uh, then you know, uh, one, uh, uh, one gigabit per second divided by eight is 125 megahertz. So that means you have a 125 megahertz clock. 125 megahertz clock, no problem in your everyday ASIC, not even a problem in an FPGA. You go to 2.5, divide that by 8, and all of a sudden you're looking at 312. You go to 4.5 and divide that by 8, and all of a sudden you're looking at something in excess of 500 megahertz. So what we're seeing is uh, a lot of designs, people, uh, you know, they don't want to go to 500 megahertz. Uh, they want to maybe stick in the 3 to 500 uh, megahertz uh, type of range. And certainly there's no way you can do that in an FPGA. So what do you do? You go to 16-bit uh, PPI. So uh, if you take, uh, take 2.5, all of a sudden, instead of being at 312, you divide that by 2. And so this shows you the projection of 16-bit uh, PPI. Uh, and uh, here, if you went to 32-bit PPI, then these are the kind of numbers you would get. So if your goal is to keep your, uh, your DeFi application you know, under 400 megahertz and you want to go to 4.5, then you got to go to 16-bit PPI. So uh, what you see out here is uh, this is the, uh, this is uh, CFI, uh, this out here is CFI 16-bit PPI, and this is uh, CFI 32-bit PPI. Now what uh, I've done here is when this was put together, uh, normalized it to uh, data rates per lane. So in CFI, you have 2.5 gigasimples per second and 2.5 gigasymbols per second. Each symbol represents 2.28 bits. So if you take 2.5 times 2.28, you get 5.7. So 5.7, that's this number here. This number represents 2.5 gigasymbols per second. And so 2.5 gigasymbols per second divided by 16, that gives you, or divided by 32, that gives you a clock rate of just under uh, 200 megahertz. Uh, if you're uh, at 16-bit PPI, you get a clock rate of something on the order of 356 megahertz. So those are the kind of rates. So you can see it made sense for CFI. If they hadn't done 16-bit PPI, you'd have numbers that were way up here at, at very high clock rates. So that's going to impact your design. Uh, this is going to impact the, the rate that the controller operates is the clock rate that is going to be handed off to your logic. So your logic is going to have to run at similar rates or higher rates than the controller. Uh, and it's going to have to run at uh, the same kind of widths. So these are important things as you're thinking about your design, you're thinking about uh, your clock structure and your, uh, your data width processing. Uh, these are the kind of things that you need to keep in mind, not only for what you're trying to accomplish currently, but where you think you might be migrating. If you think at some point in time you're going to migrate to 4.5, then if you don't want to have to rip up your architecture because you're going to double the width of everything, then maybe what you want to do is, is incorporate that width now in your current design so that you can make an easy transition to a higher data rate in the future. So that's where, uh, that's where all the trends are going there. So now what I'll do is I'll turn it back over to Ashraf. He'll tell you a little bit more about the FI side of things, and then we'll wrap this thing up. So. Uh, just spend a minute here uh, talking about the Excel funds and what they support. Um, so uh, we uh, do have a full portfolio of, uh, for FI, CFI, DFI, and FI. Um, we have been supporting FI, uh, multi files for over 10 years now. We started uh, at one point gig for the DFI, and um, currently um, we are uh, at 2.5 gig. Um, we also have a uh, DeFi only and a CFI DeFi combo. Um, so we have DeFi only, uh, combo, CFI only, and also the MFI. Um, we have a very broad uh, process mode uh, coverage, uh, going all the, way, uh, all, all the way from 180 nanometer all the way to 16 nanometer. 
Uh, we have very wide coverage in terms of the different foundries. Of course, all the major foundries are, uh, are there, TCMC, MC, Global, SMIC, uh, and others. Uh, our IP is full featured, supports all the um, uh, mandatory and optional um, um, uh, FI uh, um, uh, features. Uh, and of course, we believe it's a differentiated IP in terms of the uh, power area. Uh, also, all our IPs uh, have been silicon proven and have been integrated and run to production uh, with many of our customers. All right. Okay, so just a couple more slides here and then we'll open things up for questions. So uh, our first generation of controllers has been available uh, for a long time, been very widely used in combination with uh, the Mixel FIs. And as you'd expect, uh, those controllers uh, were 32 bits wide. Uh, that's what the market needed based on four lane, uh, eight bit per lane DeFi. With the new 16 bit uh, PPI uh, being adopted in the marketplace, we've now released our second generation controllers, uh, CSI2 and DSI2. Uh, and what we've done there is we have set up the uh, controllers so that we can uh, configure them to 32 bits or 64 bits. And just because there's uh, a potential need for 64 bits, there's still a lot of people that are targeting 32-bit uh, four-lane DeFi designs. Uh, that's still the majority uh, of the designs that are being started uh, today. So basically, if you uh, only need 32 bits uh, to uh, minimize size and power, because those are lower, lower data rates, then uh, we support that. And if you need to transition to 64 bits uh, for, uh, to minimize the clock rate associated with higher data rates, uh, we support that. And you know, between 32-bit and 64-bit, if, uh, if you design your logic and you design uh, anybody, any logic that you design, whether it's the controller or, or your logic, when you go from 32 bits to 64 bits, roughly speaking, the design is going to be twice as large. So there's definitely a trade-off there. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an important trade-off for you to consider. On the other hand, if you uh, design your logic now to be 32 bits, and then in the future you want to transition to 64 bits, then at that point in time you're going to have to redesign your logic. So you know, there's, a, there's a design trade-off there. You know, what do you want to do? If you're going to start a design today, are you going to target 32 bits or are you going to target 64 bits? That's, that's an important question. Uh, the controllers that we offer, uh, very uh, full feature, high performance, uh, easy to use, and uh, most importantly, uh, uh, developed as a full uh, solution, fully integrated, validated uh, with Mixel FIs. We deliver one package that includes the controller um, and the FI together. Okay, so let's wrap this up. From a, uh, from a conclusion perspective, uh, as you've seen, without a question, uh, the trend towards higher resolution, and that's, people typically think about resolution, but it's not just resolution. It's also increasing pixel depth. Uh, it's also higher frame rates, 30, uh, 30 hertz to 60 hertz, et cetera. Uh, those, uh, those increasing uh, trends, all of them contribute to the need for higher, higher data rate interfaces. And what's impressive uh, about what the MIPI Alliance has done is, MIPI Alliance is on top of this. Today, the standards are there that are gonna be needed uh, out in the future uh, three, four, five years. Uh, those standards are already in place, so there's a robust roadmap that's already in place, and the standards, as, as things go beyond uh, the needs that are identified today, those, those standards will continue to evolve. So that's all in place and done. Uh, good job, uh, MIPI Alliance. Uh, and those trends uh, impact MIPI designs in a bunch of ways. Uh, obviously, you have to have higher I.O. and data rates, which is uh, taken care of by the FI. Uh, but most importantly, for your uh, user logic, you're going to have to have wider interfaces. Uh, there's the need for multi-mode FIs. Uh, and another thing that people are talking about, and there's a presentation later on by Hardent, uh, is uh, looking at the introduction of data compression. So with data compression, you can, uh, you can reduce the data rate by potentially a factor of, of three. That's the typical data compression that people uh, do. Uh, but a data compression core is a reasonably large core. So once again, there's another uh, trade-off. Uh, is it better to use data compression uh, and reduce the data rates, uh, but have a larger design, uh, which is potentially more cost, or is it better to run the data rates, uh, the I.O. and data rates higher, uh, which potentially uses uh, more power, depending on the trade-offs between the I.O. and the compression core, uh, but you know, keeps the design smaller. Uh, 
So that's another design trade-off. So if you're interested in data compression, I definitely encourage you to attend uh, the Harden presentation. Uh, and so these are all the kinds of things uh, that you uh, need to th be thinking about uh, as you are going through and not only design your product today, but also hopefully a product that will, you know, have a roadmap for the future. And, uh, and one of the things is, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mixell and Northless Logic, you know, our customers come to us and they're trying, you know, they're not necessarily MIPI experts. They're, they, they're not worried about MIPI. They're trying to create a product uh, that happens to use MIPI. So they, they, uh, they come to us and, and we share a lot of our expertise and what we see in the marketplace to help them kind of figure out, you know, how they want to address these different trends. So if you uh, have some market needs or you, and you want some more information, uh, Mixell has a booth out in the Grand Hall just right out there uh, and we'll be there. Uh, and you can also contact both of us uh, directly. Uh, here's my contact information and uh, on my website. And Mixell Ashraf has uh, his, his contact information and his website. So feel free to uh, visit our websites. And if you have questions and you're trying to figure out what might make sense, uh, get some feedback from us and uh, get uh, more information on what we offer, uh, please come and talk to us. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, uh, Ashraf. Any questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. I'm glad to see one brave soul out there. <laughs> this would be really embarrassing. Oh, are, I, there's no brave souls out there? No, I, 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 I can take the bravery. <laughs> Excellent. I, have, I do have a question, actually. Perfect. I was, uh, think it's something times interesting, uh, the way you put all the different options uh, of files and control controllers and frequencies and data bits and all that. Can you shed, uh, shed a little bit of color like when a customer comes to you, how, like, how do they approach it or, or how you even help them um, that hey, this is the best for you or something like that? Any, any, can you shed any, any color based on what you heard so far? Yeah, so I'll give uh, part of the answer and then Ashram can give uh, part of the answer. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's, there's really what we see is there's, uh, there's kind of system uh, driven down requirements uh, which, uh, uh, from the controller perspective, we kind of deal with, and then there's sort of process-driven uh, up requirements. So I'll talk about the system part of it, and then Ash will talk about the, uh, uh, you know, his perspective. So when when we engage with customers, you know, they're assuming, okay, I can find the phi and the data rates that will meet my needs, but you know, from a system level, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of questions like, what data types am I going to support? What frame rates? Uh, you know, how uh, how do I do this? How do I do that? So. Uh, what we do is we engage with the customer to kind of go through uh, their take on the requirements uh, and then we basically kind of help them analyze things from a system level perspective uh, to basically go th uh, and, uh, and, you know, kind of bottom out on, okay, exactly, you know, what's the best design implementation? And, you know, the kind of trade-offs, you know, there's no right answer to these things. It's, it's, it's a trade-off. And so the main thing we try to do is just help the customer, you know, understand those trade-offs so they can make, you know, decisions that, you know, appropriately balance things. Well, um, I guess um, on the file side, uh, it's a little bit different, but also similar in the sense that uh, we have to understand what is uh, the customer's uh, target uh, market, what is the priority, and uh, in terms of power and area and, and, and uh, different uh, design parameters. I think what is different is um, a lot of the time, um, some of the process mode and foundry decisions are driven by the file availability. So a lot of our customers say, well, where, where do you have um, the, um, uh, this particular file available on which node? And, and that, uh, in a lot of ways, is a determine or have big influence on uh, the customer choices. Um, other than that, of course, a lot of questions about uh, the different <coughs> uses for the different files and why there are three different files and uh, we try to explain and uh, give them feedback about what's available out the market today and in the near future that they uh, should uh, be building their system to work with, right? So that's part of what we uh, help customers understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question from the audience? Excellent. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.